In Rabat, capital of Morocco, a 75-year-old woman is rushed to hospital. Her stomach is swollen and she's crippled with pain. Doctors think she has an ovarian tumor and take her immediately for an ultrasound scan. To my great surprise, we could only see a mass that was strange and bizarre. We said to ourselves, this woman is hiding something. The doctors are baffled, and to try and find out more, they send the woman for further scans. The radiologist is shocked by what he sees. Inside the stomach of the 75-year-old woman is a baby. But even more shocking is that this baby had been conceived 46 years before. In 1955, in a small village outside Casablanca, 26-year-old Zara Abu Talib was pregnant with her first child. I was very happy to be having this baby. I had cravings for everything. I had pains and bleeding. The baby wanted to come. But after 48 hours of painful labor, the baby was still not born. Zara was rushed to the local hospital. The doctor checked me and they said, if they didn't do a caesarean, then I wouldn't have the baby. But in the ward, Zara saw a woman in terrible pain die in childbirth. When I saw what happened to that woman, I couldn't stay there. If I was going to die, I would rather die at home. Convinced she would suffer the same fate, Zara fled the hospital and returned home to her village. I was like a crazy woman because I could not have a baby normally. I was in so much pain. In the days that followed, Zara suffered excruciating labor pains, but still the baby would not come. I stayed with my sister beside me, and she looked after me and said, if you don't give birth, I'll give you my daughter. I felt him moving. He gave me pain. He would move to this side and to the other side. That's the time, maybe, he was dying. After a few days, the pain stopped, and the baby stopped moving. At a certain time, I couldn't feel him anymore. It was then that he started sleeping. Zara believed in a local myth known as El Rakt, meaning sleeping baby, and that one day her baby would wake up. I could still feel him inside me, and I thought, if he wanted to stay sleeping, then I would let him stay. Soon villagers began to talk and came up with their own theories about what had happened to Zara's baby. They said somebody must have cursed me. God only knows if that's true, but the baby never moved again. To try and forget the sleeping baby inside her, Zara adopted three children. Her children grew up, and had children of their own. 46 years later, Zara's excruciating pains returned. 
her adopted son became worried about his mother's deteriorating health. I started taking her to the local doctors. The pain was making her feel heavy. She felt ill. Sometimes she felt weak. I took her to doctors in Casablanca. We took her everywhere. We tried everything. Then we heard there was this doctor in Rabat. Racked with pain, Zara was barely able to make the grueling four-hour journey to the hospital in Rabat. Somebody knocked on my door. I opened the door to find an old woman who was exhausted. She had a protruding belly and was being supported by two people. Professor Uazani suspected Zara had an ovarian tumor which was causing her swollen stomach. He immediately took her for an ultrasound scan. When I saw the scan, to my great surprise, I discovered a mass that I couldn't identify. I couldn't even guess what it was. It was strange and bizarre. Zara's stomach revealed a mysterious white mass that looked nothing like an ovarian tumor. Baffled, the doctor sent Zara to a specialist radiographer for a second opinion. The only thing we saw on the scan was white. It was a calcified structure of some sort. We had no idea what it was. The mass was still a mystery. The radiographer performed a more detailed scan. He was shocked by what he saw. What he had discovered was a baby. The baby Zara had conceived 46 years before. He came back 45 minutes later with a scan in his hands. Pale, shaking, and he said, Professor Wazani, this is a pregnancy. In a hospital in Rabat, Morocco, an incredible discovery had been made. A scan of 75-year-old Zara Abu Talib's abdomen had revealed a baby conceived almost half a century before. Doctors could not believe what they had found. I was so surprised that I did a scan again. And it revealed a pregnancy. An ectopic abdominal pregnancy. Ectopic means out of place, outside the womb. In a normal pregnancy, the fertilized egg travels down the fallopian tube, implants and grows in the uterus. In an ectopic pregnancy, the egg implants in the fallopian tube. In extremely rare cases like Zara's, the fetus bursts out of the fallopian tube and then develops in the abdominal cavity. Most fetuses cannot survive past three months here. But Zara's fetus had somehow survived to full term by attaching its placenta to vital organs inside her stomach and remained there for a further 46 years. La Mysteriously, a part of the fetus remained connected to the mother's blood supply and continued to grow. In 1955, when nine months pregnant, Zara thought she was in labor, but the pains she thought were contractions were the baby's distress as it was running out of oxygen. The baby died and somehow became entombed inside Zara until the day doctors discovered it 46 years later. We knew that this was a big event in medical history, exceptional. We thought there had never been a case like this before. 
we asked ourselves, how is it possible to keep a full-term fetus in her abdomen for so long? Professor Uazani was faced with the difficult decision of whether it was safe to risk surgery to remove Zara's fetus. In Zara's case, the danger was that she would bleed to death on the operating table as they separated the fetus from her vital organs. It took five days to decide on what to do. And the decision of whether to take this risk was not easy for me. I had to isolate a body from within another body and remove it. It was attached to her internal organs, bladder, stomach, veins. Anything could happen, especially with a 75-year-old woman. Despite the risks, Professor Wuzani decided to go ahead with the surgery to try and remove the fetus and free Zara from pain. Zara was now faced with the caesarean she had run away from, terrified, so many years ago. But this was no ordinary delivery. Though doctors knew that Zara's baby was inside her, they had no way of knowing what it would look like or how difficult it would be to free it finally from Zara's body. When we opened the abdomen, we came across a mass under the skin. The surprise was to find a mass that was as hard as rock. It was like the scalpel was hitting a stone. They found that not only had the baby somehow turned to stone inside Zara's stomach, it had also fused with her abdominal wall and vital organs. The first attachments were so glued to the skin, we thought to ourselves, maybe we should stop. Despite the risks, doctors decided to continue to remove the baby from its tomb. The operation was to last for hours. After discovering the fetus that had lain inside Zara Abu Talib for nearly 50 years, surgeons decided to go ahead with the perilous surgery to remove it. The problem of extracting a body that has lived within a body for 46 years is not something to gamble with. Zara was forced to face her fears to undergo this dangerous operation. Of course I was scared. I was scared to death, even going to Rabat. In the old days, we didn't have operations. It is just my health that has failed me. If I hadn't been in pain, then I wouldn't have gone. Surgeons had no idea when they began the operation just how fused Zara and her baby had become. They began to separate the fetus from the abdominal wall before attempting the dangerous procedure of detaching it from Zara's vital organs. Any minor slip of the scalpel could have punctured these organs and cost Zara her life. Alors vraiment parce que la tête the head was encrusted, pinned inside the bladder, and needed precision and meticulousness on our part to push aside the bladder without wounding it. There was a hand that was problematic because it was calcified and intertwined with the intestines. It took surgeons almost four hours to separate the baby from its mother. They worked carefully and cautiously and finally removed the fetus from its tomb. 
Zara survived the dangerous surgery, and after 46 years, she had finally given birth to her baby. Doctors had never seen anything like it before. It was amazing. An incredible surprise. It was completely calcified. The fetus removed from Zara's stomach weighed seven pounds and measured 42 centimeters in length. It looked as if it was made of stone, yet eerily retained some of its human features. But to Zara, it was the baby she had been pregnant with so many years ago. I knew it was a baby, even when the doctors told me it was just a lump. It was a baby. It was a child. Specialist pathologist Dr. Kitani examined Zara's fetus in an attempt to solve the mystery. What happened to the baby? And how did it remain inside her for so long? We, we recognize the head. The right arm is clearly visible. The fingers are perfect. Here we see the longer limb and thigh. I realized straight away that this was an authentic fetus. We recognized the head. One exterior limb was almost complete, as were parts of the exterior. I was astounded at how well conserved the fetus was, even after so many years. The duration and longevity of the pregnancy are something really extraordinary. Research has revealed that Zara's baby is a lithopedian, or stone baby. Only 300 cases have been reported in medical history. A stone baby results when a fetus dies during an ectopic pregnancy and is too large to be reabsorbed by its mother's body. The baby becomes a foreign body to its mother's immune system, putting her at risk of dying from infection or rejection. What is exciting about this case is the question of why there is this tolerance. Why did this alien body remain inside the mother for so long without rejection? The mother's body protects itself by wrapping the fetus in a calcareous substance as its tissues die and dehydrate. As the calcareous walls build up, the fetus is gradually mummified, becoming a lithopedian or stone baby. Each stone baby is unique. This baby remained inside its mother's abdomen for 18 years in Brazil. In the Congo, surgeons removed this stone baby three years after it was conceived. Zara's stone baby is one of the oldest lithopedians ever to be removed. To unlock the secrets of how Zara's stone baby remained inside her for so long, Dr. Kitani has dissected the fetus. Here we see the brain, the spine, the kidney, the liver, and the digestive tract. And here you see the calcified layer around the fetus. This wall of stone has acted as a barrier between Zara and her baby for 46 years. It is a miracle. A miracle that she survived all of these multiple complications. Any of them could have killed her. She could have died from any of these things. Hemorrhage, infection, sepsis, and rejection. An ectopic pregnancy that reaches full term and remains inside its mother for 46 years is unprecedented in medical literature. After a final weekend with her family, Jane Ingram returned to London to face life-threatening surgery. Doctors would attempt to remove the two babies growing normally 
in her uterus and try to save the life of the third baby growing ectopically in her stomach cavity. You don't want to think of the worst. You try and think positively through everything. But it was at the back of your mind that if Jane uh, was to pass away and all the babies, you had got to be there for the rest of the children. I had to go to the plant procedure many times, consider all possible options. And for me, it was personal, it was a very emotional issue, because the only abdominal pregnancy I've seen in my whole career before that, which was beyond 28 weeks gestation, was in the woman who actually died as a consequence. And I had this in the back of my mind when I saw Jane, and was absolutely determined to avoid such a disastrous outcome in her case. I said, I've got to survive this. And he knew that, and he knew how much it meant. Davil knew how much it meant to me to survive. But I did say to him, I said, I said, don't feel a failure if I don't. <laughs> I, I had to get that across to him. I said, because it, the odds against us, they were just stacked against us. There were specific worries that the ectopic triplet would not survive the operation. A paediatrician come to me and said, there's 99.9%, .9 these were exact words, that he would die, he wouldn't survive this. And I said, I don't want to hear. At the moment, he's still alive, he's still inside me, you know, if he's got this far, he'll go a lot further. On the morning of the operation, Jane and Mark said their goodbyes. We had to have a sign, we had to have something, and I just said to him, you just tell me that you love me when I come round, that way I know I've got through it. So I was just walking alongside the trolley until he actually, he actually went in the theatre. They said, well, you can't go any further, you know, beyond these doors, which is fair enough. You know, I know the procedure, so... Just had to go around the other side of the hospital and, uh wait. A long wait. <laughs> The ectopic placenta was so attached to Jane's vital organs, it would be easy to rupture it during the operation, causing massive internal bleeding that would kill both mother and all three babies. A team of 26 specialists had been gathered in order to cope with any number of critical situations that could have happened. High volume blood loss, organ failure, and cardiac arrest. We decided to make a relatively large cut on her abdomen, which will give us enough space to manipulate the babies and deal with the major bleeding should the bleeding occur. Two baby girls, Olivia and Mary, were delivered from Jane's uterus first. The movement of their delivery alone could have disrupted the ectopic placenta. After the two babies had been delivered safely from Jane's uterus, the most dangerous part of the operation began, finding and delivering the third baby from Jane's stomach cavity. Once uterus is emptied of the two babies and shrinks in size, the placenta of the third baby, which was attached to the uterus from the outside, could be disrupted. And just the process of uterine shrinkage could have actually caused bleeding inside the abdominal cavity. I was sitting outside the corridor, literally where the operating theatre was. You're sitting there and your whole life could potentially fall apart. You know, you could lose your partner, the kids, and then you have to restructure your whole life. It's, it's, it's so hard to explain. It's like, it's like a vacuum. You're just like living in a vacuum. But um, at the same time, it's fingers crossed, you know, just, just trying to stay positive, think, well, you can do this, you can do this. You've just got to hang in there. The surgeons began to search for the third baby. I knew exactly where the baby is and how baby is lying, but I couldn't see it because it was completely covered with the loops of bowel. We managed to remove the bowel to enable us to identify the fetus. We made a very tiny cut, not more than four or five centimeters, and I just managed to grasp his, his bottom and his legs, and I gently eased him out through this uh, hole. The critical part of operation was not to interfere with the placenta because any disruption of placenta blood supply could cause severe hemorrhage and 
If this happens, it is often impossible to contain the bleeding. After two tense hours, the third baby, a boy they named Ronan, was born. But his placenta was so fused to Jane's vital organs that to remove it would have killed her. Dr. Yurkovich had no choice but to leave the placenta inside Jane. Davor came out and told me everything went very well and I was over the moon, I was so relieved. And then he told me I'd go and see Jane in recovery, so I went in to see Jane. And uh, she was in a lot of pain, which is understandable, you've got, but you've got to be alive to feel pain. And uh, I was there to tell her I loved her. I felt this searing pain in my stomach and I'm just going, pain, the pain, I'm shouting out the pain and I think I was coming round. And I heard Mark saying, I love you, Jane. And I thought, oh, I've made it then. And that was it. I was gone. I don't remember much more. Well, for Jane, really, it was kind of unknown territory. Uh, she, was, she was still very ill, even after the operation. She was still very, very low. The triplets were immediately taken to intensive care. As soon as we finished the operation, we were focused on the babies because we had no idea that the babies would be healthy and able to cope with the extrauterine life or not. Born two months premature, the babies weighed less than two pounds each, were unable to breathe independently, and were vulnerable to infection. Even if Ronan survived the crucial first weeks of life, he could have been left with lasting mental and physical damage from the abnormal way he had grown inside his mother. It was just the size of them. They were just so small. It, it was hard to get your head around it. I knew they were going to be small, but when you actually see them physically, I mean, it's unbelievable. You can, you can fit them in the palm of your hand, no problem. I mean, that's head to toe. They would fit in the palm of your hand. Tiny, absolutely tiny. I remember being wheelchaired into this special care baby unit and I remember holding Ronan and they were so tiny, they were so hairy. They were like tiny little baby monkeys. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe them, really. And I remember spending some time with them. Not very long. I was just watching, I was just fascinated that they'd got through what they'd got through. Although she had survived the surgery, Jane's life remained in danger from the placenta left inside her. I felt very relieved and very happy, but once you resolve one problem, you think about the other one. So I was worried about possibility of delayed hemorrhage. Then I was worried about possibility of infection, possibility of sepsis, which is also a very serious complication which can endanger mother's health. The triplet's birth was in itself a medical miracle, but their survival depended on their progress in the weeks that followed in intensive care. And I mean, they can get very ill very quickly. So it was still like you were skating on thin ice. It, you weren't quite there yet. You weren't quite out of the woods yet. When the operation to remove the baby that had lain inside Zara Abu Talib for 46 years was safely completed, she could finally grieve the child she had tried to forget. On a psychological level, it is my belief that there was a certain sadness. She was mourning for her dead child. This is quite normal for a woman who was pregnant, when to deliver, and then had to put this child out of her mind. She had to relive this pregnancy when the baby was finally removed. I wanted to have a child of my own, to be a happy woman, but God did not rule this for me.
In a twist of fate, it was Zara's fear all those years before that probably saved her life. Lack of technology in 1955 meant that Zara's doctors had no way of diagnosing that her baby had grown in her abdomen. Had doctors attempted a cesarean, they could have cut through the placenta attached to her organs, and Zara could have bled to death. I can forget now and put everything in the past. Zara knows how lucky she is to have survived and to be able to enjoy the rest of her life with her adopted children 